everyone. I'm Stephen Brantley. And I'm Michael Diego. And we are the Social Enterprise Guys. We're two social entrepreneurs building a network of social enterprises to help each other do good business better. This week on the podcast, this first episode, we have Dr. Garima Sharma from Andrew Young School of Policy Studies at uh, Georgia State University, and she is the Director of Social Entrepreneurship um, at AYS. And a uh, big thank you to Nathan Stuck, um, the Chapter President of Be Local Georgia, uh, for making that introduction. You guys are going to love this episode. Dr. Sharma is exceptionally knowledgeable, great to talk to. Uh, it's a great first episode. It will be a crash course into social enterprises. What are they? What's social entrepreneurship, social impact? Uh, we have a lot of material to cover. It will feel a bit instructional, uh, but that's by, uh, by design. This first episode is meant to give you uh, give all of us the tools that we need to have a more conversational dialogue as we move through uh, with additional episodes of the Social Enterprise Guys podcast uh, after this one. So you'll see all the links and all the information in the notes below below the podcast episode so or the YouTube episode. So follow us on social media, subscribe to the podcast, subscribe to uh, YouTube so you get all those updates when we put them out. Uh, join the Facebook group. Uh, and like I said, we'll have all these links down below. So go ahead and follow along and uh, stay tuned for, for the second, third, fourth episodes. Definitely. And we have our call to action. So like we said in the trailer, we are going to have a call to action for each episode, something that uh, can help you guys become more ingrained in, in the uh, social enterprise movement. So the first one is if you are a social entrepreneur or if you are a social enterprise, then just acknowledge that on social media. Share it on your social media platforms, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, everything. Uh, we will have a graphic and you can um, share that as well to, to make it easy. Yeah, let's get this episode started. Okay. Let's do this. Dr. Sharma, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me, Stephen and Michael. It's such a pleasure to be here today with you. Yeah. Well, we wanted to start off with a little bit of your background. Could you tell us more about how you got into the world of social entrepreneurship? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I um, am from India. And so I grew up in India. I, um, you know, there was poverty all around me, even though we weren't poor. But, you know, I saw all these social issues and environmental issues as I was growing up. And then I come to the US to do a PhD in business. And all of my colleagues are asking, how do we help the next Fortune 500 company make more money? And which is a valid question and it's a question worth studying. But I just found it hard to um, reconcile the two worlds, you know, of the one that I've grew, grown up in with all these issues and the one that I was in where research was used to sort of make the rich richer, you know? And um, the way over time that I reconciled those two worlds was to, you know, understand how business can be used as a force for good, a force for making positive change. And so that was over years, you know, chiseling away at what I'm really wanting to study and how I want to contribute is how I stumbled upon uh, this notion of social um, enterprises and social entrepreneurship. And, you know, as you uh, said at the beginning, I am the director of the social entrepreneurship major, we call it Bachelor in Interdisciplinary Studies, um, social entrepreneurship program here at Georgia State, which has really given me sort of the support and push to uh, be bold about how entrepreneurship is no longer fringe it's mainstream you know and uh, really craft my teaching and research around social entrepreneurship yeah i already, well, I already have a couple of questions but uh, it, Stephen, i'll let you go no no, no, no. go ahead go no ahead. that that's that's it's all you 
Yeah, no, I mean, some of the first things that come up to my mind, um, as you were, so you came over to the U.S. for your PhD, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, and you went to uh, where? Sorry. I went to Case Western Reserve in Cleveland, Ohio. Right, Case Western. Was there a specific um, issue that you saw growing up or, or uh, getting your PhD that you felt was like, kind of like, this is the first kind of social entrepreneurial, uh, you know, uh, experience or venture that you were considering or was there something like specific like I, I get the your your kind of growing up story um, but was there something specific that like was it climate was it more social or yeah I mean so a major issue in the developing world including India which over time I realized is really something that you know makes me want to address it through my work is uh, inequality uh, that is manifested through either poverty or through gender inequality or through access um, you know, of resources. And um, entrepreneurship is uh, said as a solution to a lot of these ills where, you know, uh, if you go to a slum in India, you will find many, many entrepreneurs, you know, stand a uh, fruit vendor at the roadside or somebody, you know, having a thatched hut and selling uh, uh, you know, the local snack. So there's just so much power in this idea of entrepreneurship that can really make the, at least somewhat make the playing field level in the sense that, yes, these people who are living in abject poverty can actually use business to improve or for social mobility or to really get a livelihood. So I think this notion of inequality and poverty and gender inequality too is something that I'm really passionate about. Yeah, awesome. Super yeah, uh, I, I was cu curious, uh, you know, the United States struggles with a lot of issues of uh, wealth inequality and inequity. Uh, do you, what kind of similarities do you see between the United States and India? Wow, yeah, I mean, I do see, especially I want to say over the last couple of years, you know, there's just so much uh, dialogue and discussion around just inequality based on race, based on socioeconomic, uh, you know, uh, um, systems that we have created for us. And I think India gravely suffers with that, you know, so we, we don't really have talk about race there, but we talk about caste, you know, and caste system is something that's extremely hierarchical, you know, it's based on your profession, not profession, but sort of is based on the work that you do, you know, so if somebody's coming to your home to clean toilets, that's very caste based. So you're sort of stuck in that lane for the rest of your life, you know. Um, and so I do see, you know, in terms of the kind of race based discussions that are happening and how entrenched they are in the United States, I see a lot of similarity with how I grew up seeing all these inequalities around caste. Got it. In you had mentioned that uh, that um, there was a moment when this movement went from more of a, a fringe uh, movement to more of a mainstream movement, and that's where you felt more emboldened to be more creative in, in your studies. Um, was there a specific event that you felt like was a turning point for the movement as far as like, okay, you know, I could throw out some examples, but was there something specific that you felt like kind of caused this transition or was it just a building up and then um, you felt like it became mainstream one night? Well, I think there are a couple of events, although they don't completely align with my timeline, <laughs> but there are sort of a couple of events in the group social um, entrepreneurship movement that uh, come to my mind, you know, I think, uh, I don't know if you guys have heard of the Ashoka Fellowship. Um, I believe it was in the 1970s that Bill Drayton is his name, who's sort of the founder of Ashoka. And Ashoka is this very network of what they call themselves social change agents, you know. So they would um, they nominate people and as fellows and they support them through money, through resources, through connections to really do this work of social entrepreneurship. And it's really an, uh, a very prestigious sort of, uh, you know, organization. In any case, so this uh, person, the founder of Ashoka in the 1970s sort of went to India and sort of over time realized that, you know, all this work that is being done in this very dispersed manner around the world where you know people are using business to make positive change 
sort of needs a label, you know, and he's the one who really coined this label of social enterprises, you know, and that was all the way back then. And then if you think about, you know, some of the other events, you know, uh, over the last three decades, consumer awareness around, you know, uh, wanting to buy responsible products, not associating themselves with irresponsible companies, um, impact investing, the growth of impact investing has very much supported the social enterprise movement. And one uh, really valuable event that happened uh, in 2006, 2007 was the launch of the B Corp movement. And B Corps are really these for-profit enterprises that commit to doing a good for the environment world. And they have like five stakeholders defined. And this third party called B Lab certifies them. So it goes practices and it tells them if you have 80 on 200 score, you become a B Corp. And just that whole movement around B Corp really gave so much energy to social enterprises. I think that really changed, you know, it gave us the vocabulary, it gave us the language, it gave the legitimacy to be a social enterprise. I would also say universities have played a great role, you know, um, and um, maybe later in the conversation, we'll talk about the program at Georgia State, but you know, um, it just so uniquely positioned, think about it, a social enterprise program in the School of Policy Studies. So the students we are attracting uh, want to serve, right? They want to be in the public sector, they want to serve, they want to you know, contribute to a collective benefit, but then we're equipping them with tools of business to be able to do that. So how do you create, how do you use business model canvas? How do you use systems map? How do you use this? And so we take their motivation to serve and we equip them with business tools and prepare them. And this is just one example, you know, uh, there are many, many universities like Oxford, Harvard, you know, they have these various certifications, various electives you can take, various classes here in Atlanta Tech, Emory, every sort of behind this, right? So I think that also helps prepare future leaders to be able to do this work. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I think like for me and the time that I've been in academia or now in the professional world, it's, it's always been a pretty big priority for brand, for the brand image of the corporation, you know, for um, society at large, you know, I studied a, an arts, Bachelor of Arts. Um, but uh, yeah, it feels like for me, it's always kind of been a higher priority. Um, and as we learn more about it, we understand how, you know, how important it is uh, for enterprises and entrepreneurs, but cool. Yeah. And I, I, I will say we're really happy to have you on board at uh, Andrew Young School. I, I graduated from Andrew Young School at Georgia State University with a Master of Public Administration. And, you know, Georgia State and Andrew Young School specifically is re really well positioned for this type of program. They're really interested in collaborating across sectors and, 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 and building a network um, in, in various industries and sectors. So uh, we're really happy to... Uh, to, I'm, I'm really happy that this initiative is, is something that's uh, so important to the school and that you're leading it. Um, well, we, we want to go a little bit into the kind of some of the definitions of these concepts that we, we talk about all of these words with social in front of it. Um, and we, we really wanted to make this for listeners that may have not even heard about social enterprises before this. And then when we're new to the movement ourselves, even though we're social entrepreneurs, uh, we're, we're new to the movement. So we're learning as well. Um, we are the social enterprise guys. So we'll start with that one. What is the, I know there are a lot of different definitions out there, but what's the definition? Um, what is a social enterprise? Yeah, and I just want to emphasize that, Stephen, there's so many definitions out there. And, you know, uh, I could put on my academic hat and say, you know, that's bad, but I do want to put on my change agent hat and say, great, right? So the bigger tent we build, the more people will come and more impact we'll have. So, you know, I'm going to just share my definition of what I talked my, with my students about and just sort of a caveat that there are many others who would describe social enterprises differently and that's fine you know so uh, the way I imagine or understand social enterprises is that if you take this spectrum where on one side is nonprofit organizations that are 
uh, singularly focus on collective benefit. And on the other side are for-profit organizations that are singularly focused on their individual or shareholder benefit. Um, social enterprises can actually lie anywhere on that spectrum, right? So I, when I teach social entrepreneurship, my, my students in their teams will build social enterprises as we go through the course, piece by piece, and the variety is just astounding, right? So some of them would be so close to nonprofit that I have to push them and like bring them <laughs> toward, toward the middle or toward the for profits and make sure what's your financial sustainability strategy? What's, you know, how are you going to make money? How are you going to, while some are so much toward the for profits that I have to sort of pull them and say, okay, what's the collective benefit? How do you create impact and so forth? But that's great. You know, that means that an entrepreneur can, she can choose to be anywhere on the spectrum. And just to give an example of those who are new to the idea of social enterprises, my favorite example is Grayston Bakery. So this Grayston Bakery is a well-studied case in many uh, business school classrooms. What they do is that they have this for-profit commercial bakery and their idea of impact is that they will hire previously incarcerated people, which as we know, find it very hard to get employment, right? So, you know, they bring them, they train them, they sustain them so that their metric of impact is, you know, they're sort of stopping relapse or going back into the prison system. Uh, at the same time, they have a nonprofit arm where they engage with training, um, education, awareness, rights of, in, you know, previously incarcerated. And so they work hand in hand where, you know, Know, this commercial enterprise by employing these people is financially self-sustaining while this nonprofit is able to accept grants and so on and so forth and does this all this outreach work. I also like this example because it helps me illustrate what's often called hybrid organizations. So social enterprises, another word for them is also hybrid organizations and they are called hybrid because many of them have this, you know, for-profit, non-profit structure, you know. Um, many, not all. So there are like many, many social enterprises, like all of the B Corps are completely for-profit enterprises, right? But the word particularly hybrid is see, uh, understood in terms of the structure that one creates, which mimics both for-profit and non-profit. But um, Greystone Bakery is a good way to understand and remember sort of what social enterprises are. So are you saying in this example that there are actually two legal entities that fit into the bakery and one of them is a nonprofit and then one of them is like a corporation or an LLC? The bakery itself is a for-profit and then they have this nonprofit sort of another entity. Um, so so the pe people working in the bakery, uh, they, you know, they can be trained, um, you know, in this nonprofit arm in addition to sort of the job training. This nonprofit arm also does other kind of education of awareness work, you know. And been, then, but I like, excuse me. Sorry, go ahead. I was saying I like your question because you know when we talk about hybrid structure, uh, you know, an important thing to understand for the on um, social entrepreneur to make decisions, there are pros and cons on both. Uh, for-profit and non-profit structures, right? So, so let's say I have a non-profit arm, I'm a for-profit entity, I have a non-profit arm, I still will have to do all the uh, reporting that is due of non-profit organizations. I still, uh, so that's a con. The pro for me is that I can accept grants, which a for-profit entity cannot accept grants, you know? On the other side, uh, for a for-profit uh, entity, you know, Again, my source of resources is very limited. It could be investors, it could be family, it could be so on and so forth. But then I don't have to do all this extensive reporting and extensive legitimacy building. I also want to, again, emphasize that there are many social enterprises that have nothing to do with the nonprofit organization. So there's one in Athens that I really like. Um, uh, they often come to my class to speak. It's called Last Bottle Clothing. And what they really do is they're fully for-profit organization um, and they use a recycled bottle to make t-shirts and sell those t-shirts. That's sort of, there's no nonprofit element to them, but that's the choice they have made in terms of organizing or designing their own organization. In this example with the bakery, um, before we move on really quickly, just one more quick question. Um, 
is this the nonprofit was structured just to serve this to serve this uh, organization or to partner with this organization or does it um, was it existing and then the uh, bakery partnered with the nonprofit? So the, as far as I know, this nonprofit is, you know, hand in hand with the bakery. I don't think okay. it's, uh, um, you know, and the other thing going back to why, how I would make that choice and an entrepreneur to do this hybrid kind of organizing. One other thing could be, you know, that actually some of the money that I make as a for-profit organization, I can actually donate to the nonprofit entity as well. So that's another benefit of this uh, hybrid structure. Right. Okay. Yeah. No. But again, not everybody follows this. I think it's very complicated. <laughs> yeah, I guess I was just trying to get a sense of, um, do you see that typically these social enterprises will partner with the nonprofit to add that element of, um, you know, social, the social entrepreneurship to their organization or they build these entities simultaneously, you know, or is it really just a, depending on the, the leaders of the company and their decision-making process? In my understanding, it's actually when I, the, so when you hear the word social enterprises, if, we, if I have to shed all the complexity, they're usually for-profit organizations. Right. Like okay. the of Clothing or Gooder is another for-profit social enterprise in Atlanta, sort of, you know, really famous. So these are really uh, for-profit organizations. But then, you know, the other, the Greystone Bakery is an example of another way that social enterprises can organize themselves. Right. Yeah, and, and here we also agree with the approach of, you know, using a pretty broad definition of social enterprise and, you know, really growing that umbrella. And, and so we, we typically use the definition organizations that use or that solve social problems with market driven approaches, which is very similar to the Social Enterprise Alliance. Uh, their definition. Uh, and, and by the way, when, when you mentioned that spectrum, you know, business or for profit on one side, nonprofit on the other, and a social enterprise can fit anywhere in between. The Social Enterprise Alliance's website actually has a pretty cool uh, visual representation of that. It's like it has the, you know, the for profit on one side, nonprofit, and then kind of a uh, word cloud in nice. between describing uh, social enterprises. Um, but yeah, could you, could you talk a little bit about the, uh, the different types of social enterprises? I, I know that we've, we've discussed B Corps or, uh, benefit corporations. Um, and, and so, so what kind of, uh, how do we talk about or categorize different types? Well, I think that what I was describing earlier in terms of sort of where do you lie? So, you know, some lie closer to the nonprofit and some lie closer to the for profit. That's one way to understand, uh, you know, the types of social enterprise, seeing them as hybrid enterprises in terms of organizational structures, another way. B Corps and non B Corps, like you said, Stephen, is another way. Um, so, those are usually what I come across in terms of people describing social enterprises. Beyond that, I don't, I don't think there is a, you know, universe accepted sort of categorization that people have uh, created. Um, but I think even this is a <laughs> lot in terms of um, keeping in mind and understanding, yeah, what social enterprises are. Yeah, yeah. It seems like people you know, talk about it in different ways, and and you know, I, I know one podcast on nonprofits, and it's called "Nonprofits Are Messy," uh, but I would say that social enterprises are messier. It's it's a very complicated or it's a co complex field to be in, uh, navigating all these different structures, and you know, you can have for profit businesses that have subsidiaries that are nonprofit, mm -hmm. or the reverse. You can have nonprofits that have for profit, or they could be two completely independent peer organizations. But it, it is a fascinating, fascinating uh, world to be in. Um, so we talked about about social enterprise. What about social entrepreneurship? What what do we mean when we use that term? Yeah. So you know, when we think about a sort of the word social, you know, so if we just look at the word social, you know, what comes to our mind is community and society, right? So that's sort of social. When we think about entrepreneurship, you know, it's, it's uh, how would you describe entrepreneurship to someone is that, you know, you sort of see an opportunity and you seek an opportunity, you know, lev you leverage it and you organize, uh, uh, you know, enterprise or business around it in order to add value in the, in, an entrepreneurship case to the customer mostly. 
But when we think about, when we put those two together, when we think about social entrepreneurship, you know, it's still about seeking opportunities, but it's about seeking opportunity for shared value creation in the sense that I'm considering all of my stakeholders when it comes to, uh, you know, value, uh, in addition to seeking financial sustainability, even financial growth for my organization. Um, and, uh, you know, if I have to sort of lay it down in terms of, you know, how that looks like, when I compare it to sort of a regular entrepreneurship or social entrepreneurship, we will still follow each of the steps. We will define a problem. We will do, you know, an analysis of who else is solving the problem. We will create sort of a social business model, which is similar to a business model, but, you know, think broadly in terms of partners and products and so on and so forth. And then you will uh, orchestrate or design your theory of change in terms of, you know, what inputs and activities that you're drawing upon to create their outcome. So you do all of these steps that you would do in a mainstream regular entrepreneurship, but all you're doing at each of these steps is that you're not you know, sort of blinders on, only focused on your customer or your shareholders, but now you have sort of taken into consideration a broader benefit of um, you know, each of your stakeholders that are important to you. Yeah. Well, well, what's the, uh, what's, the, what's the best argument or what, what's, what's your argument for why we should be focused on um, the broader society, you know, and, and a lot of people would say, you know, we should focus on competition and that's going to determine uh, or just, just selfish um, uh, incentives. And, and that's going to determine um, what's best and the consumers will determine what's best through that system, the traditional capitalist system. Uh, wh why should uh, social entrepreneurs uh, develop businesses that are socially aware and conscious? Well, I, so there are many um, arguments we can present to people. I'm going to describe just three of them. So one is this business case argument. Okay, so business case argument means that uh, millennials and Gen Z are asking for these responsible products and services, right? So, uh, you know, it reduces your risk if you focus on the environment, if you focus on society. So there are many ways that it's better business to focus on a broader set of stakeholders. So that's one argument. Um, you know, usually that's what most end entrepreneurs look for, you know, when they talk about, okay, how do I make a business case for looking at this broader set of stakeholders? The other is just a normative moral argument, right? Saying that, okay, um, you know, I have this responsibility as an entrepreneur to not just do good for myself, but do good for the world. So, and a lot of people are driven by that, right? So a lot of people would say, okay, even if in the short term, I'm making a loss, which means I don't have a business case argument in the long term I'm going to benefit all you know so that's sort of a more normative argument I think what I resonate the most with and I hope that that's where you know conversation in general around social entrepreneurship goes systems argument so systems argument says that whether I acknowledge or not I am a part of a system when I run an enterprise right so I am impacting the environment. I am impacting my employee's family. I am impacting, you know, the ch uh, child worker in Bangladesh from whom I'm sourcing my products, uh, if at all. And so without considering the system, I'm gonna face many, many unintended consequences that I'm not looking at right now, right? So Uber is a great example amazing innovation, but look what gig economy is doing to us in terms of precarious work, in terms of people trapped in poverty. Facebook is another great example, right? It's sort of, who would imagine <laughs> that they would have that kind of um, impact, you know, on our democracy. So without considering the system, I think entrepreneurs are likely to face many, many and unintended and consequences down the road that they would not face if they start with this idea that I'm part of the system and let me organize myself in a way where I'm considering what's my impact on you know, the entire system. Do you, do you think that these enterprises are taking a more systemic approach to growing their business or do you think it's a PR um, move as far as like when I think of the examples that you use and I think of um, the recent uh, endeavors into to social more social movements right like what's your take on um, some of these like I wouldn't even call them legacy but like these these companies that have 
in the beginning, very clearly, they didn't take a, a very systemic look at their impact, right? Do you think that they are actually more conscientious and making more, you know, systemically uh, relevant decisions? I think that's why where certifications like B Corps are useful, you know, because uh, it's a third party, you know, you open yourself to somebody else coming and evaluating you and really show, telling you where your practices are harmful and where they're helpful for the world, you know. Um, of course, there's always greenwashing. I mean, a lot of a lot of companies, I don't know if a social entrepreneur would go around greenwashing, but a lot of for-profit businesses claiming CSR and sustainability can definitely, there's sort of nothing in our um, regulations or policy really stopping them from, from making claims because we don't have a standardized way to talk about these things, right? Um, so there's definitely greenwashing. I guess, I guess systems thinking is so hard, <laughs> right? I mean, think about ourselves. We are taught in terms of thinking about cause and effect. Right? That's how we, we, we're taught to reduce complexity. We're taught to like narrow it down, reduce it, talk simply, tell your uh, story clearly. So there's always this cause effect linearly that we're looking at. And giving that up is very hard for leaders, for entrepreneurs. And, you know, so that's one of the things I hope our students take away when they go through our classes is that really understanding how to create a systems map in making these decisions. So we have tools out there that they can use to create these maps and understand their impact and really incorporate that impact in their decision making. So um, I, I mean, at least for the future, <laughs> you know, managers that we are leaders that we're nurturing, I'm hoping they will think in more in terms of systems. Is it common for these larger organizations to pursue, like, I'm thinking of FANG, right? Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, um, to pursue that type of certification, like? Well, so B Corp certification started with a, for small businesses, even solopreneurs. The, uh, now a couple of MNCs are coming in. So Danone is one, um, Unilever is one, but they're also only their subsidiaries are getting uh, B Corp certified. It's not the whole, but just knowing the B Corp movement where they want to go, they want to create these standards for large companies as well. You know, um, but B Corp is just one. I think there are other. There's this fair trade movement. There is ISO fourteen thousand one for environmental certification. I think there are things out there that organizations can draw upon. But the the thing is, it's all voluntary, right? So if my customer, my vendor, my you know, if they're not asked for this certification and I don't have a normative reason to engage in the certification, why would I? So I think it's um, that, that's where sort of the, the gap lies, I think. Yeah, and just to be clear on the, the B Corp, there, there's a, I don't, I, I guess we haven't discussed this yet, but there, there's a, this complicated element there where there is B Lab, B Corps that are certified by B Lab, by a third party, a nonprofit organization. And there's also the legal structure of mm -hmm. a benefit corporation that or a b corp that's that's uh that's actual it's an alternative to a c corp or an llc um and it, it, could you could you speak a little bit about that uh, what's the current state of those um those two places like i i know that only certain states in the united states have uh passed that legislation and georgia's uh just went into effect in january of this year but how many are we at now? Well, so that you raise a great point, Stephen, because even those who have been, uh, you know, hearing about B Corp for a while, they get confused between the two phrases. So like you said, B Corp is a certification. Anybody can go on their website. You can see the number ticking in terms of how many companies globally have been certified. Last I checked, it was about 3,500 or so around the um, globe. 
you know. Um, and uh, but the interesting thing that people don't often talk about is that anybody can take that certification. So let's say you know your podcast, your company, you go take that certification. And you can decide, I don't want to get certified. You, but you can just use the answers to change your practices, right? Because it tells you your score. So, you know, they actually call them other sustainable businesses. And those are thousands and thousands, you know? So the assessment is not only playing the role of, you know, okay, you're BCOP certified. It's also playing this role of reflect on your practices, identify weaknesses and strengths and change, you know, even if you don't want to get certified. Then the benefit corporation that you talked about is certainly a legal entity. Um, I mean, sorry, legal um, structure option where, uh, you know, you sort of, uh, so your state legislature tells you that, okay, I can get incorporated as a benefit corporation. Um, and um, those two overlap, but they're not completely, say, uh, you know, same in the sense that there are many, many more benefit corporations than there are B Corps. I think uh, from what I remember, there's some stipulation in B Corp certification that within a year or two, if your state has that option of uh, benefit corporations, you have to sort of become a benefit corporation. So, you know, and I, I, for my own research, I read a lot about, you know, the sort of thinking of B Corp founders since they said, and I, since they started, and I think in their mind, this institutionalizing through corporate structure is sort of the way to, you know, because then you can really walk your talk, you know, mm -hmm. then you can actually say that, okay, I'm going to take this decision because I legally can take this decision to consider all my stakeholders. Yeah. Well, and the 36, to, to, to your point about how many, 36, I believe states have benefit corporation, uh, you know, option available. And yeah, I think Georgia was the latest one. Yeah, yeah. I, I was thinking it was 35, but I guess Georgia makes that 36. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. they, um, so there's also this term social business. What's the difference between a social business and a social enterprise? So Professor Muhammad Yunus, who's, uh, you know, whose work around Grameen Bank really started this whole microfinance movement, he's in Bangladesh, um, he coined this term social business from uh, what I understand, um, you know, just uh, what the field says. Um, so what he says about social business is that Unlike what we talked about in terms of social enterprise where I can make profit and I can impact the world, he says that no, whatever cash you generate, whatever surplus you generate, you've got to feed it back into your um, enterprise. So for him, there's no dividends, there's no you know, profit sharing, there's no nothing. You sort of take whatever you make and you feed it back so that there's financial sustainability in what you're doing. The difference with, uh, between that and sort of a nonprofit organization would be that you're still not dependent on grants, you're still not dependent on donations, you have this motor of business keeping you going. You know? Got it. And what's and, and all of these pieces, all these things that we've discussed already are part of a, a broader stakeholder capitalism movement would you agree and 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 what what does that refer to what do we mean when we say stakeholder capitalism versus shareholder capitalism yeah and i think you said it right this uh, it's a sort of a world view or a stance you take that scaffolds all of that we've discussed so far in the sense that you know any big small large or uh, you know medium sized business like patagonia or um, i don't know ben and jerry's they can they can say that uh, you know as a business we choose to focus on all of our stakeholders and not just shareholders so i'm going to take care of my customers you know my employees uh, my suppliers, uh, the environment, and so on and so forth. And so they design these, uh, you know, programs or they change their decision in order to um, take into consideration stakeholder, um, all, all sets of stakeholders. And so I'm going to tell you that I love this example from my uh, one of my research that I'm currently doing. So we interviewed, you know, so CEOs, CFOs, about 137 of them in Canada, because that's where I was before I moved here. Um, 
And so this was a forestry company. So this has got nothing to do with social enterprise, large for-profit Canadian forestry company. Um, and they're telling us an example of how they decide what's the logging area um, that they can they should sort of craft for themselves um, within the regulation. So the regulators tell you that this is your sort of logging area, but within that also, how do they make the decision? And they're talking about going from sort of door to door in the community, asking people to weigh in on what the people living there think, what is the logging area. And it's not, to, to them, it wasn't just a PR move because they were showing us evidence of actually changing the boundaries of their logging area and, you know, incurring some loss, incurring some, you know, cost to reducing their logging area. So I think that's a great example of stakeholder capitalism. You're not just going at one metric of how can I make the most money for my shareholders. You're also involving the community in it and saying, what do you want? You know, what, what would sustain our interest, you know, in us uh, being here as a business? Yeah, definitely uh, focusing on uh, reducing negative externalities, you know, the things that might affect others and not just the people that that own the company. Uh, and, and another you know, example would be uh, a plant going in and uh, they could either be focused on shareholders and not care about pollution and, and what they're putting and dumping into the water, or they could focus on stakeholders of so people in the community the uh, the animals that you know use the the water and, and everything and and you know mitigate the uh, the damages and the uh, negative externalities from that and that would be an example of um, a stakeholder capitalism. Um, so we, we've already discussed a few milestones in the the social enterprise movement. Um, what where are we today? How rapidly has this movement um, grown? Yeah, I mean, so I, I'm obviously a little biased <laughs> because, um, you know, I teach and study this movement. So I see it, you know, I can appreciate the growth. Um, so the current crisis that we are in currently, the pandemic that we are in has just revealed just so many fault lines around gender, around around climate and you know the 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 dialogue in society around you know these really important issues is at such a peak point you know and people are talking about the next crisis you know climate change is being sort of our next big thing we deal with and so you know just trusting or just putting all of the onus on the public sector or the nonprofit is uh, really not our only option. I think businesses will have to play a role. Businesses will have to um, not just be part of the problem, but also be part of the solution. I think people want that, you know, and this pandemic has really sort of shown us that. I also think that, you know, uh, grant and philanthropy dollars have been on a downward trend over the years. Um, while the growth of nonprofits has been huge, you know, so I was looking at this uh, 2019 nonprofit employment report, and it said that actually nonprofit employees make up the third largest workforce in the US. And so that's astounding. So just think about sort of the resources, the, you know, grants and philanthropy dollars available there vis a vis sort of this growth of nonprofit. And it's great that there's so much growth, but I also think that social enterprise and business who want to do good sort of fill some of that void in the issues that you know we've been talking about and the lack of resources so I do feel that um, you know this given this uh, the crisis we are in this movement can only be up and up um, and you know our students I go back to sort of our students asking us to um, you know talk about responsible businesses to sort of equip them with tools to create responsible businesses and they're frustrated by the singular focus on capitalism sort of this new generation does not want to adhere you know to this uh, just one regime of capitalism and 
even those who may not be joining social enterprises or launching social enterprises, they still want their business to be responsible. So I think all these various sort of uh, actors and stakeholders point to the fact that this moment is sort of just going to grow as time passes. Do you, do you see it as uh, in the future as every business one day becoming a social enterprise or, or uh... Are you not willing to make that ambitious of a uh, prediction? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that would be an ideal world, but you know, I think it's hard to, not only hard to make that prediction, but also our systems are so entrenched. I think our systems of capitalism are so entrenched, you know, because people like us sort of hang out with people like us and talk to people like us. And we look around in Atlanta and there's so much social innovation happening. I was in New Mexico or before this, and there's just so much happening around addressing these important issues. And, you know, but there is this whole world out there of finance and accounting and, and Wall Street um, that um, is still the mainstream world, you know? So I think um, a complete overhaul, um, I don't know, but I think what is exciting are the innovations that are happening like B Corps, you know, that really give people an option to, to um, launch their business differently. Yeah. Well, we'd like to talk some about your, um, your research. Um, so, so what are some of the research area or interests that you have and uh, what's, some, what's been your focus over the past few years? Yeah, um, so, you know, so I, I would describe my research in sort of two different uh, tracks and they're kind of related. So one is this, uh, what we've been talking about up till now, you know, I'm really interested in how uh, business can be a force for good. So I study sustainability in big, big organizations, CSR in big organizations, social entrepreneurship. So that's one focus. And uh, the other focus that I have is around, you know, how can, management research impact management practice. You know, so we do all this research, we use public funds, we, you know, get our salaries and uh, it kind of lies in our uh, virtual drawers, you know? So how can really research make a difference? So I studied that also. Um, I don't know if you want me to go into <laughs> any of the examples, yeah, uh, sure. but those are the, yeah. Um, so I, maybe I'll share about a B Corp paper that was uh, published about a year or two ago. Uh, so what we did is that B Lab released uh, data to, I, I wanna say around that time, five different teams across the country um, from various universities. And so what they gave us was the assessment data. It was anonymized, but it was you know multiple cycles of assessment data. So what we wanted to ask me and two of my co-authors, what we wanted to ask is that, you know, do practices change from one assessment to another? You know, so are you improving your scores from one assessment to another? Because our, ho our hope was to really understand the learning mechanisms based on the assessment. What we actually found is that, you know, a better way to understand change is in terms of configurations of practices. So yes, practices change, but they kind of change together, you know, so that's sort of one insight where these configurations change over time. And this change can be explained in two ways, what one we call the external factors. So it depends on how big of an organization you are and which sector you operate in, depends on which configuration you're part of and how that changes. And then we also call what we called endogenous factors in the sense that the nature of the practices explain change in practices. So um, company or these enterprises go for their low hanging fruit <laughs> practices the first. So they would do, okay, let me change the supplier uh, policy. Let me write an employee uh, governance policy. So they would always change the low hanging fruit. They also uh, change um, B impact assessment practices that are more abstract. So if I say, if the question asks me, uh, do you use renewable energy? It doesn't tell me, you know, if it's wind, if it's solar, if it's possible, like what am I you know, um, talking about when I say renewable energy? So there's degrees of freedom to interpret it. And those kind of practices are, were also the one that changed from one assessment to another because 
I think the um, uh, these enterprises interpreted them in their own ways and they were allowed to um, because B Corp certification is such a broad certification across industries. Mm. So that's one example. Okay. Yeah. But what are some uh, the what what are some blind spots in the in the research field of uh, social entrepreneurship, social enterprises? Uh, where where could we really use some additional support in that area? I think a big uh, blind spot, and it's hard to do, and that's where I really hope uh, you know my own work can contribute. Is right again going back to this idea of systems. So how do you study mm -hmm. systems? How do you track systems? How do you understand influence in systems? How do you identify leverage points in systems? I think that's where I'm hoping that the social entrepreneurship and even this entire business as a force for good conversation goes. You know, and you know, and that and related to the second stream of work that I talked about in terms of how research impacts practice, I think academic how can academics play a role in that in terms of supporting social enterprises to think in terms of systems. You know? So even if you think about SDGs, right? Usually the way we uh, which are sustainable development goals, you know, and so it, when we think about SDGs, we really think about them in terms of lists. So SDG one, SDG two, et cetera, et cetera. Nobody talks about interrelationships with them, but I'm. Uh, but if we look at an entrepreneur's experience, a lot of these goals are, you know, some support the other, some trade off the other, some compensate the other. So there's this relationship that we really don't fully um, understand in research. That that's where I think it's a big blind spot. So we have to take this systems relational view to understand social entrepreneurship. I think. Yeah, while you're while you're talking about that, I'm thinking about how challenging it might be to measure some of the impacts with like digital and society and like some of these other more like um, industrial systems might be easier to measure like output uh, specific uh, chemicals or but as it relates to the impact of you know I think of social media specifically and like the Facebook example that we used earlier like how does one really you know measure the impacts of that kind of technology you know yeah yeah, so true, Michael. And not only just how do you measure, but how long should be the time frame? And do organization really have the resources to think about measuring in five years and 10 years and 20 years, right? Because some of these don't immediately happen. Some of these more broader systems issues. You know? Yeah, I feel like that would be extremely challenging. Uh, earlier, you talked about um, the, the second example, which was more about... Um, I'm sorry, the first one you used was about millennials and Gen Z being a, a business driven approach with your students. And maybe this is kind of a tangent, but do you see like when I think of more of like my millennial friend group and now I hear about um, Gen Z's coming into the market and being a, a, a stronger consumer, um, do you see a stark difference between the ways of thinking of these generations or like what's your perception or maybe research that you've done? Well, I mean, so you mean between millennial and Gen Z or between, right, yeah, yeah. between no, the two be groups? Between the two groups, correct. I don't know I, if I have really sort of thought about it with so much nuance. I think I get a very self-selected group of students who are uh, very aware of, you know, uh, these issues. Um, but like you said, Michael, you know, social media has played such a huge role in giving people the language and giving people the vocabulary to understand and talk about these issues and you know so I see that and have a dialogue uh, you know around what this means in terms of you know all these social and environmental issues that we're facing um, I think you know if I think about sort of you know going back to India you know if I think about people growing up there and when I interact with them, when I was their age, I think the, the, the language they're using is completely different than what I would have understood in terms of what is the role of a, of a business in addressing some of these issues. So I really see an awareness, that's for sure, yeah. And you know, in, I mean, so we have this, at Georgia State, we have the Social Entrepreneurship Club and I get, uh, so I can see sort of the membership role, you know, who has joined and we get uh, students from biology, 
and English and accounting. And so there's sort of this whole diverse group. And what is really holding them together is sort of their, you know, their specific uh, generation, right? So that also gives me an indication that this generation has the understanding and the language to talk about these issues. When I think about it, I think of um, how some of these social platforms, these digital technologies were introduced when we were you know, graduating from high school, right? But for a Gen Z, the, that kind of technology and that kind of um, ability to access information like that was kind of in their tool belt from, from the beginning. Um, so it, it is very interesting and it makes me really think about like the next, so Gen Alpha, right? Mm-hmm. And like them having all of these like more AI, more machine learning, more sophistication, you know, like what, what does that, how does that paint the future of social entrepreneurship, right? With all of these technologies and all of this awareness and access to information, like what is ahead for the movement uh, because of technology? Yeah, I mean, I haven't really uh, thought as deeply as you sort of uh, clearly you're asking, but, you know, I'm thinking about any business, uh, you know, in general, drawing on the, you know, latest and greatest innovation. I also think technology affords us transparency, and I think transparency is great for, for, you know, progressing on social and environmental issues. So I think that's definitely a tool, something in the toolbox that social entrepreneurs can use when we think about technology. I think the other thing technology does is it affords us connections, you know, and again, connections is so important when we think about these kind of movements and when we think about social entrepreneurship and, you know, uh, connecting not only people, but connecting resources country to you know beneficiaries in another country thinking about fintech and how can I uh, mobilize uh, this money and finances and resources to really make a change where it's most needed so definitely all these tools uh, would only benefit uh, social entrepreneurs and as we've seen you know there's pitfalls of all these tools too so sort of keeping that in mind as well have you heard of purposity or purposity I don't know if I'm connected pronouncing it correctly, but they're a startup here in Atlanta that all they do is they give um, individuals who want to make an impact and then the nonprofits, basically a marketplace to connect the two, right? So Mm -hmm. a a local school could post about their need for um, specific types of resources on this platform and then individuals with those resources can donate. Um, So when I think of technology, that becomes like an immediate example of how this company is using um, technology literally to build a marketplace it's very explicit it's like these are our needs like people looking and interested in this movement you know come serve our needs come you know donate come your time um, so yeah I just thought that was a good example as you're yeah. speaking to it yeah for sure I think uh, you know creating that marketplace technology can really enable that and you know uh, We have something called Main Street Fund at Georgia State, where we invite applications for, you know, seed ideas from the community, from our students. And I often evaluate those submissions and it's loud and clear that most of the products and most of the services that these entrepreneurs are designing are around technology. And I think Atlanta is such a great place to be in terms of sort of really drawing upon this power in technology. There's an incubator called Techstars that has special sort of lane for social impact crossed with technology. And there's just so much, so much resources and support in Atlanta for those who want to take the take that track. Yeah, yeah I think that's a good segue into like our, our next point, which is like, what are some ways that the audience either here in Atlanta or people listening from wherever um, could get involved in, you know, the social enterprise, social entrepreneurship movement would be, would be a good starting place, I guess I would ask. So in general, what would be a good starting place? I think Zoom is sort of this, our virtual world has opened so many spaces for us. And, um, you know, there are, uh, 
so many events happening that people can join. We post a lot of, uh, we organize and post a lot of events through Georgia State, Andrew Young School and Entrepreneurship and Innovation Institute at the business school. So I think following any of these organizations in terms of their events, we do a lot of social entrepreneurship type events that people can join. Um, I think a lot of, um, you know, sort of Georgia Social Impact Collaborative, GSIC, is another net network that I have personally drawn a lot of benefit from. What they do is that they bring in all these social impact ecosystem builders and actors, and they have their own newsletter, their own listserv, their own events that people can join to get to know more about uh, social entrepreneurship movement. Then there's Be Local Georgia, that's specific to B Corps, you know, so each uh, region has its own local chapter to grow the B Corp movement. So Be Local Georgia is also, you know, on LinkedIn, on, uh, you know, I believe on Twitter as well. And what you can do when you sort of follow them is you can sort of follow along the events that they're organizing around B Corps, around responsible businesses and so on and so forth. Those are, those are wonderful awesome. suggestions and all um, great um, organizations. So I highly re recommend you guys uh, subscribe to their newsletters um, and, uh, and and get some more information on that because they're, they're great. Um, how can people learn more about you and the BIS and social entrepreneurship at Georgia State? Yeah, so I so we have tons of information on our program website. You know, so it tells you what our goals are. It tells you about the degree requirements. It tells you how you can be involved. Um, and so, sort of that would be a great starting point. Um, our department is on social media. It's on you know our school is on LinkedIn and social media. I think following them would also give people updates on all the latest events happening. Um, and of course, you know, I hope that through this uh, conversation and other conversations that people see me as a resource to reach out and see how we can collaborate together. So I'm happy to share sort of my email if you have, you know, space on your uh, podcast feed or page to add that. And I would always welcome conversations with people. If you are a social entrepreneur, like come talk in our classes, let's, let's collaborate, let's figure out how we can each other's work you know hire our students hire them as interns and employees so that we can have these uh, you know network of people working on causes and hopefully we'll be back in office soon so i will <laughs> i will be around you know um welcoming people who want to have that conversation dr awesome. sharma yeah. yeah thank you Great. do you have any um other questions michael do I have any other questions? Uh, gosh, usually I have a whole bunch of them. No, you've <laughs> we done covered a great a lot. job. Of, yeah, covering a lot of material. I guess one of the things is like, you know, COVID-19 presented such a paradigm shift in a lot of things from how we come together, how we interact, how we, you know, travel. Um, do you, has there been any like interesting research that you are undergoing or that you are on the periphery of or just like, curious about that looks at the, all the changes that kind of happened in such a short amount of time and, you know, what, you know, what it might mean for the movement or just society at large. Well, I am, don't have an active sort of research project around it, but I have written, so, you know, an essay and a commentary on the kind of research we must do that the pandemic has shown us. And, you know, so it's really for social entrepreneur and sustainability researchers. And the crux of that is what we really talked about. We have to rethink how we ask research questions that are systems-based, you know, and we cannot just work it. Silos. So our methods to answer this, those questions, our collaborators need to be, you know, interdisciplinary so that we can actually address this idea of systems when we think about social entrepreneurship research. And I'm happy to share that as well. I believe awesome. It's yeah, no, I definitely want to check it out. We should uh, include that in the, all the links that we have with the, the podcast. Definitely. But awesome. Yeah. Off the top of my head, I, I think you like covered a lot of it, like really appreciate uh, you coming today and talking with us.
Yes. Well, thank you so much for having me. This was great. And I just appreciate the opportunity uh, to be able to talk to both of you. And I hope this is just first of our many collaborations together. I'm sure it will be. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Bye then.